My name is Luke Anthony Walsh. I am 21 years old. I'm a broadcast journalism student at the University of Bedfordshire. And I guess this is my story. I was born on Tuesday the 6th of January 1998 at the Luton and Dunstable Hospital at approximately 39 minutes past 9 in the morning uh, to my mum Sheila and my dad Kieran. But my take of Luke is that he's obviously autistic um, and therefore his brain operates in a way that is considered uh, different to the, the way that neurotypical people think. I was first diagnosed in September 2002. I was about four years old. And at that time, I suppose when anyone's growing up, um, you're not really aware of your surroundings, I guess. Um, and sort of my knowledge of when I was diagnosed and what um, how I developed from that all, all came from the stories from my mum, I guess. Um, I was a late developer. Um, I couldn't really walk or talk um, or really function that well uh, by the age of four, and that's really where she got suspicious that something was wrong. Um, and I was taken to a few clinics. I went to paediatricians, and I was, I was diagnosed with autism. Um, and I suppose it all started from there, I guess. Autism is such a new concept and soon a, a new notion. And certainly a lot of the people I speak to have not um, encountered autism within their life. In terms of preconceived notions is that we're all, we're all crazy. That we're out, we're, we're, we can't control our emotions, we can't control what we say, we can't control what we say before we say it and that we have almost like spasms of aggression or violence or uncontrollability when at times that simply isn't the case and to have that preconceived notion is quite negative and it's quite hurtful and still plenty still to come here live on Rage Lab 97.1 FM in the next half an hour we will have the start of the tennis when it comes to primary education and junior school, um, that's when the social element starts to come into it. In the UK and in the US and in some parts of Europe, there are, there are some support structures in, in educational institutions. But then of course there's that individual variability that comes with just whoever that person is that's in that school supporting that child or that person whether or not that person is stigmatizing themselves or uh, really values what they're doing and has good morale, you know. So even if there's provision there, it could come down just to the quality and experience of that individual. So it's very, you have to be very lucky ultimately to, uh, to get something and to get something good that works over time that is helpful. The first main help apart from the council and, and, and uh, support that way um, was, was, was through education. Um, I was given like teaching assistants who um, supported me through my learning um, with the best way that they could and for me that really felt that first sort of levels of support was important for my family and also for me um, I was bullied heavily um, I, there was this one guy who I won't talk about uh, bullied me for about seven years, seven or eight years. He bullied not only me but my family as well. Um, and it got to a point where, especially at nine, ten years old, when I was going through school, I didn't want to go to school. Bullying is is a is not a surprise when it comes to autism.
people tend to bully other people when they, they represent something different and that perhaps they can take advantage of, of that difference. But in terms of being labelled and being bullied, I mean, certainly people have called me crazy. They may have said it to my face, they may have not said it to my face, but they've thought I was out of control. They might have thought I was an idiot. It's stupid. But at the end of the day, it's not... I'm not, I'm not going to stay up at night thinking about where they are now and why they've said it and why they've what why and, and almost relive that moment in time I'd much rather look forward and be better than them um, I was 16 years old I had no real direction I knew I wanted to be a journalist um, but I had no idea how to get there I applied for a foundation year in broadcast journalism and that's when my life changed. Uh, women's hockey uh, will be starting in a bit as well and so plenty of more uh, still to come between now and six o'clock so more points still to be won. That's really been my story uh, for the first 10 years of my life. Um, I didn't really properly function uh, and pick up the skills such as walking and talking and I uh, suppose to eating properly and so on until I was about two or three years old. Um, but then some, there was a catalyst somewhere. Um, my dad was, um, to put a long story short, a vile person. Uh, he, was, he wasn't even around when I was born. Um, he was in and out of prison. He was a career criminal. Um, he was an alcoholic. He was obese, pretty much. Um, he died when I was 10 years old, um, he pretty much, I, I, I always tell the story that he killed himself, um, but when you're deliberately, when you're an alcoholic and you're drinking so much on a daily basis, which you used to do, um, then your liver, chemically and scientifically speaking, would have probably given up. So in, in, in that sense, he probably did it to himself. Because I never really grew up with him, I have no fond memories at all. Because all of my memories, I guess, of my dad have always been subjective and secondary. Um, people telling me stories, people telling me how he used to be, how, you know, one minute he was a successful guy, he used to drive around in, you know, in Mercedes Benz and be a um, chauffeur for you know, the rich and famous in London in the 90s, which must have been a a unique atmosphere to then be a career criminal uh, in and out of prison for uh, fraud and speeding and all sorts of things um, to then divorcing from my mum in about 98, 99. Um, so so in, in, in that way I never really had any connection but it, it sort of over the years the realisation that he was my dad and I did lose him absolutely hurts. Here on Varsity 2019 live here on Rage Lab 97.1 FM Good morning What is the atmosphere like uh, down at the Robertson Centre? And of course, I was saying earlier on to Kieran Nixon talking about hockey. I mean, swimming is one of those sports which has really picked up momentum in the last decade with London 2012 and Rio. You look at look at the likes of you know Rebecca Adlington being really the the star, the the, the shining star uh, of the pool. Um, do you think there should be good competition here today? Then I met my fiance. <laughs> um, we met on Tinder. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, we met, we went out for lunch, and when we spoke, and when we, we started talking, I could feel a strong connection. My initial thoughts when he told me they had autism, um, well it was okay because I've got friends that have got autism anyway, 
so I was kind of used to it. But his autism, you can't really tell. You can tell in certain situations, but not, not all the time. My life has been made a hundred times better for meeting her. She's been able to fully, be beyond fully understand my autism. She goes out of her way to accept who I am and accept my condition. And she does what she can f for me. And I, I suppose vice versa, I do what I can for her as much as I can. His autism affects our relationship in several ways. So, say if you want to go out eating somewhere, so go to a restaurant, if he doesn't, he's really picky with his food, so if he doesn't like the sound of anything there, he won't go there, he won't try new foods, which is annoying sometimes. Um, and like things to watch on TV, if he doesn't, if he's gonna say it doesn't interest him, then he's not gonna watch it or listen. And if you have a conversation on the phone, if it doesn't interest him, he won't, he'll just switch off and do something completely different. Autistic people do find social interaction challenging, but that's not to say that they can't find their own path forward that can work and can be can lead to the whole picture being better. Uh, and it isn't to say that they don't want interaction. And that is an absolute misnomer. You know, they they don't want to be lonely. So he doesn't. I don't think his enthusiasm doesn't fit with the autism stereotype because he's really, really enthusiastic in what he wants to do. More enthusiastic, because I assume that the people that I know that are autistic don't have as much passion to do things and want to be out there and do things. The thing about Luke and what's common with many autistic people is that they find social uh, interaction a bit tricky, let's say. That's not to say, it's very important to say that, that it's not to say that autistic people don't want social interaction. In fact, they like, there's no reason or any evidence to suggest that autistic people would prefer to experience loneliness. That's not, that's a non, complete nonsense. Uh, it's just that they find interpreting the subtleties of social interaction uh, a little bit more challenging, let's say. You know, there's a lot of non-verbal stuff going on. There are a lot of unspoken rules, cultural rules, social rules as to how we interact with different people and couple that with the fact that when you have many people interacting with you in one, one environment at one time, it's a particularly difficult sensor experience. Again, lots of noises, lots of things happening, lots of visual stimuli. So uh, there's a lot going on, it's very challenging, and because of all of that, meltdowns can occur or stress can occur. And again, bullies can find that an easy target, unfortunately. And I think Luke was probably victim to that. The situation where it, that made him change was when we went camping so he doesn't like thunder and <laughs> we had a thunderstorm and we were in tents and he um he had a little autistic attack in the tent because he was really scared of thunder and um wanted to go home and be with his mother she has definitely seen my meltdowns um there's been times where we've been out together and things haven't gone according to plan or i've lost you know bank cards and i've lost things and she's seen my behaviours um, where I suppose it's, it's like an out-of-body out of experience. She, she's seen the autistic me, which is somebody who panics a lot when things aren't quite according to plan. I think, you know, when I go back to the routine, things aren't going to schedule or I've lost things or I've misplaced something. She's seen me break, you know, burst into tears, shaking, almost losing my temp, you know, losing my temper with myself. Um, and she's seen that, and she's been able to calm me down and help me. So, if he's socialising, if you're explaining something to him, or if you're watching something complicated on the TV. If it's out of his normality or his routine, he gets a bit confused, and then you can tell. But um, if you follow his routine and things that he likes to do. With my course, I've covered the US and the UK election. 
within six months of each other. That was a huge opportunity for me um, to almost experience it firsthand and to really be at the forefront of journalism that night. Um, that was something I was proud of. With my show, meeting and interviewing the people that I have, um, Andrew Pierce was a, a big interview. Um, Shapu Kors Andy was a big interview for me. The way I've always thought to myself, because especially the, with, with celebrities, you always think to yourself, um, you always see them on the telly, and you think, I'll never get a chance to meet them. And I have the chance to not only meet them, but also to interview them, and get my photo taken with them, and get in contact with them, and to have that rapport that I didn't think was even possible, let alone um, achievable. So for me, having that experience and having the repertoire that I have in meeting these people and interviewing these people, it's been a huge, huge thing for me. So growing up in an Irish household um, and watching Gaelic football and hurling and supporting the Irish team, I always used to look up to Roy Keane, the Irish captain, uh, when he was playing at Manchester United. Um, and I always used to, oh, when, it, when I was an Arsenal fan, again, Thierry Henry and Patrick Vieira were an inspiration. Um, but I also looked you know, within my own circle. Um, my mum was an inspiration for me. The fact, especially now when I think about it, when even now as someone who's engaged and has these responsibilities. Um, it's hard to believe how she managed to do the things she was able to do in, in being able to support me and get through it all. But I never really had a, a fixed plan, which is really weird. Um, and I guess very abnormal. But, I, I, but then at the same time, growing up, I always used to watch the news and you know Sky Sports news and so on. So I guess there was sort of a, a direction towards journalism of some sort, um, which is, you, you could call that destiny. Um, but I would say that was nothing more than just an obsession or passion. If I'm uh, invited for an interview or I, when I apply for jobs and I say that I'm autistic and I think that's for me to prove that I stand out in a different way. I may need support in certain areas. In, well, in, in terms of a job, in terms of like whether it's extra training or, or so on, you, and some stuff like that. But in terms of fitting in the same bracket as, as any autistic person, I would stand out. I think the hurdles that I've cleared makes me more worthy. Without sounding arrogant, it makes me more, more worthy of the success that I achieve. Because I've gone through obstacles that people wouldn't have experience, I've gone through things, I've gone through pain that people shouldn't have to experience. The main thing as a society is to uh, re-evaluate, I think people need to really re-evaluate their understanding and beliefs and perceptions of what autism is. If you do encounter someone who tells you they're autistic, who is brave enough to, to come out and, and to uh, face the potential stigma and rejection that they they probably would have ordinarily faced. Give them a chance, you know. Um, try to give give them as much chance as you would anyone else, and value them like you would anyone else. And just think of them as just another ordinary person. But don't just negatively judge them and reject them purely for the fact that they're autistic. You know, give them a chance. Thank you.